Hello, everyone. I'd like to wish everyone a happy new year and welcome you to the first of our monthly nonprofit presentations in 2021. Um, as I think many of you know, those of you who have attended these before, uh, our nonprofit practice endeavors to present these webinars uh, roughly on a monthly basis. And uh, as an initial housekeeping matter, I am happy to tell you that our February uh, presentation uh, has been put on the calendar and that will be on February 11th uh, when my colleagues Meredith Boylan, George Constantine and Chris Moran will discuss how nonprofits can take full advantage of the PPP and employee retention tax credit. And again, that will be on February 11th. Uh, but we are here today on January 19th to talk about uh, postal issues. And we've entitled this discussion, Nonprofit Mailers Face Unprecedented Challenges. And I don't think that title is hyperbolic uh, because of new rules that were issued by the Postal Regulatory Commission late last year that will allow the Postal Service to impose uh, significantly higher prices on the classes of mail that nonprofits use. So we will uh, walk through that today, uh, provide some background for how we got to where we are now, um, give you an update on what's happening uh, literally in real time and uh, what to expect in the future. So I am Eric Berman, uh, that is me on the uh, upper right corner of the screen uh, from when I played in the World Series of Poker on ESPN a few years ago. And I thought that was uh, better than giving you my suit and tie website photo since I haven't worn a suit and tie in about a year. Uh, I am a partner in Venable's nonprofit and advertising practice groups. And I'm very fortunate to be able to work with uh, lots of C3s, C4s, uh, C6s in litigation, in regulatory investigations, and in complex uh, rulemaking proceedings, including the uh, postal rulemaking that is the subject of our discussion today. And I am very fortunate uh, to be joined by my co-panelist, uh, Steve Carney. Uh, Steve uh, is a fierce and tireless advocate for nonprofit organizations who use the mail. Steve is the executive director of the Alliance of Nonprofit Mailers and has been uh, since 2014, which means that when Steve joined the organization, uh, that was during the last time that the industry was facing above, uh, above inflation, uh, hefty price increases. The difference is that uh, back then, during what we call the exigency case, uh, those above inflation price increases were intended to be temporary and they were, uh, whereas the ones that we're talking about now uh, are meant to be permanent. Um, Steve knows the postal industry inside and out. Um, prior to leading the Alliance, uh, he spent decades in government. He was on the other side of the table uh, at the US Postal Service uh, joined the U.S. Postal Service back in 1980, and um, sorry to have to age you that way, Steve, but um, held senior leadership positions throughout the Postal Service, headed MTAC, the Mailers Technical Advisory Committee, was an economist with Treasury, and Steve, it's always great to talk with you, and I want to thank you for all that you've done uh, for the nonprofit industry. Thanks, Eric. Great to be with you. Absolutely. Um, so let's let's get started by placing today's developments in their proper uh, historic context. And in order to do that, we'll travel back to 2006 when Congress passed the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act. Uh, this was bipartisan legislation. Uh, Senator Susan Collins of Maine was a key sponsor of the bill. Um, but prior to 2006, and 
you know, this is this is sort of 200 years in, in 20 seconds, but for, for much of its history, what used to be the, the post office department was funded by, you know, postage that customers pay and also by congressional appropriations. And in 1970, Congress passed earlier uh, postal legislation, Postal Reorganization Act, that was designed to make the postal, the, the newly created U.S. Postal Service, uh, operate more like a quasi-independent uh, business. Over time, congressional appropriations were phased out, and the Postal Service was funded entirely um, by its customers. And uh, you know, postal rates at the time were designed just to cover the Postal Service's costs so that it, it broke even. And you know, rate setting was considered to be pretty cumbersome, um, time consuming, very litigious. Each, each rate docket was almost like a mini trial. So in that backdrop, we come to 2006, when Congress once again um, enacts significant postal rate uh, reform by passing PAYA. And what PAYA did was establish the Postal Regulatory Commission and instructed it to create a new modern system of rate making within 18 months. The, 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 uh, the new law divided postal products into two categories, competitive products and market dominant products. Uh, we'll talk about those in a second. Importantly, it imposed a, an annual price cap tied to inflation on uh, annual price increases for market dominant mail. It required the postal service to pre-fund postal employees, retirement health uh, benefit and pension accounts. And it told uh, the, the PRC, the, the, post, the Postal Regulatory Commission to review this new system of rate making in 10 years and see how it's working out. And that is the rulemaking that just concluded late last year. So for purposes of postal regulation, when we talk about postal products and we classify them, um, we classify them as either competitive or market dominant products. Competitive products are exactly what they sound like, uh, products that the Postal Service sells that face competition from private carriers uh, like UPS or FedEx, for example. And competitive products are generally less tightly regulated because we allow competition to serve as the regulator. If the Postal Service charges products, uh, uh, prices rather over competitive products that are, are too high, um, presumably customers will go elsewhere. Market dominant products are everything that, that isn't a competitive product. Um, these are products for which the Postal Service does not face uh, effective competition, products over which the Postal Service is effectively a monopolist. And you know, this covers a lot of ground, first class mail, that, you know, letters, greeting cards, postcards, um, magazines, newsletters, bulk marketing mail catalogs are all examples of market dominant mail. And uh, Steve, I, I, I love your thoughts here because you, you could speak to this better than I can. Um, in my experience, nonprofit organizations rely heavily on market dominant mail products for you know, fundraising appeals, for example, and, and other business uses. But any any thoughts on the importance of market dominant mail to nonprofits? Yes, Eric. Uh, it, it's really important to a lot of nonprofits. Uh, some of our members do virtually all their fundraising through the mail, and some of them mail out very important newsletters and magazines for their membership, and they also manage their membership through the mail. So it, it's, it's critically important. And another key part of this is that nonprofits can only spend a certain percentage of their revenue on overhead costs. And certainly postage is part of that overhead. So having that CPI cap has been very, very important for nonprofits. Even before the CPI cap under the old way of pricing, 
the Postal Service kept rate increases roughly equal to inflation. So aside from that temporary period you mentioned, 2014 through 16, we've been tracking inflation for a long time. That's absolutely right. And, and, and you're spot on, Steve. Um, there are numerous charity uh, watchdogs and regulators out there um, that look at how much charities uh, spend on on fundraising, and you know, generally, you know, more than thirty five percent is is considered you know not a best practice. Sometimes that's not realistic for especially on small and under resourced uh, charities, um, but but it is an issue to spend you know too much of, of your overhead on on fundraising. Um, so let's talk about the about the cap, the, the CPI cap. Um, as mentioned, this is baked into the law um, by Congress. And the way Congress wrote this into PAYA was as a requirement, um, not an option. The system for regulating rates and classes for market dominant uh, products shall, not may, not could, not might, shall include an annual limitation on the percentage rates, um, I'm sorry, the percentage changes in rates to be set by the commission equal to the change in the consumer price index for all urban consumers. So the CPI cap is sort of baked into the cake here and, and has been since 2006. And Congress only identifies uh, one exception to that. And it's what Steve and I have mentioned already, uh, what we call the exigency exception. So Congress recognized that the price cap is essential when you're regulating a, a monopolist, um, but also recognized that the Postal Service might need to break the price cap uh, in an emergency situation. So the exigency provision was basically built into the law as kind of a safety valve uh, to be used in limited circumstances. And under exigency, the Postal Service can request from the commission um, that it be allowed to raise rates above inflation due to either extraordinary or um, exceptional circumstances. And, and even there, the Postal Service can't just charge whatever above inflation prices it wants. Um, that price adjustment still has to be reasonable and equitable and necessary to enable the Postal Service under best practices to continue to maintain uh, the quality and service levels that is you know, required to serve the needs of the United States. Um, during the PAYA era, era, say that 10 times fast, the Postal Service has initiated uh, one exigency case. And that began in 2010 when the Postal Service uh, claimed that mail volume declines resulting from the 2008-2009 the Great Recession were an extraordinary or exceptional circumstance. And you know that litigation lasted years and it resulted in the Postal Service being able to temporarily raise prices on market dominant products um, a bit above 4% uh, over inflation until spring of 2016. Um, you know, so as mentioned when I, when I introduced Steve, you know, he lived through the tail end of that. And, you know, that, that had a, uh, a, a negative effect on market dominant mail volumes. And we'll, we'll get to those, those volume data in a minute. But again, the exigency was intended to be the exception and not the rule. Um, both Congress and the commission have long recognized the importance of having a price cap in place, um, both to protect captive mailers and also um, to incentivize the postal service to cut its own costs and operate more efficiently. And that just makes, you know, that, that just makes common sense. If you're a regulated entity, and you are subject to a price cap and you can you know, charge prices up to, but not above that cap, but at the same time, you can reduce your costs, um, then you get to retain 
some or all of the resulting you know, profit that, that you generate from those cost savings. Um, we see this model outside of the postal setting in other regulated industries. It's common, it's well accepted. And you know, some of these quotes that are here on this slide uh, came from the commission itself, recognizing how important the price cap is, um, calling it a centerpiece of PAYA um, and something that is beneficial both to mailers um, and to the Postal Service because it holds the Postal Service's feet to the fire. Eric, Eric, I would also add that our, our nonprofit members, as well as the commercial companies that work with them to produce their mail, while they don't have a regulatory price cap on what they can charge, uh, they have the equivalent of it. And a lot of them say they can't charge even the CPI. So this is meant to mimic the type of price pressure that the private sector has for a government agency that has a monopoly on delivering mail. Absolutely right. So we had mentioned earlier this, this retirement pre-funding obligation. This is something else that Congress um, baked into the legislation. And, and again, you know, both this and the CPI cap are in PAYA at the same time. So presumably um, Congress intended for them to operate uh, in, in harmony. Um, you know, if you work for the Postal Service, um, and, I, and I know, you know, some people who do, uh, you're doing okay for yourself, if I may say so. You're, you're represented by uh, some strong unions. You, you get good compensation and, and benefits. And the Postal Service offers its employees um, post-retirement health and, and, and pension benefits. PAYA established uh, a retiree health benefits fund and required the Postal Service to fund long-term retiree health benefits for postal employees and retirees uh, and their survivors. Um, set a 50-year payment schedule into this fund. Postal Service is also supposed to make payments into uh, pension funds with the amount calculated by OPM and you know, this is an obligation uh, to the tune of billions of dollars per year. And the Postal Service stopped meeting these obligations a while ago. It stopped paying into the, into the retiree health benefit fund uh, back in 2012. It's also not keeping up with, with these, these pension payments. Um, I mentioned this, and, and Steve, I know you have thoughts on this too, uh, but I, I mentioned this because uh, you know, this is something that shows up as a sort of a liability on the Postal Service's balance sheet and makes it appear as if the Postal Service is in financial dire straits because it has these, these, these long-term funding requirements. Um, I, I think that belies reality a bit. I think the reality is that, um, that the Postal Service's retiree uh, a benefit fund is, you know, it, it has over three hundred billion dollars in it. Um, its pensions accounts are are very well funded. So these are technical on paper obligations that aren't being met. Congress doesn't seem to mind, but it is being used as a hook and as a justification um, for the Postal Service to ask for permission uh, to be able to charge mailers much higher prices in order to you know, make up this alleged uh, revenue gap. Right, everybody acknowledges now that Congress made a bit of a mistake in setting up too aggressive a pre-funding schedule for retiree health benefits. And several leading members of Congress are committed to fix that in the near future with new legislation. But just to give you a sense, since the new law PAEA passed in 2006, the Postal Service has lost $87 billion, but 84% of that or 73 billion is just related to these pre-funding requirements that they're actually not making, but they're booked as paper losses. And of the remaining 14 billion in losses, 
two thirds of that is related to also non-cash charges for workers' compensation caused by lower interest rates. So the actual operating losses of the Postal Service have been relatively small over this period. And uh, the fact that mailers are now being asked to pay for it uh, is part of the problem. Absolutely. Um, and all of this rolls up into the 10 year rate making review, so called because when Congress enacted the law, it not only told the commission to, um, to create a new modern uh, rate making system for market dominant products, but to review that system in 10 years and to determine whether the system is meeting statutory objectives that Congress uh, laid out. There are nine objectives. They are supposed to be considered in conjunction with uh, 14 factors. Um, we're, we're not going to list all, all of the objectives here today, um, but some of the key ones are things like, you know, the system ought to maximize the postal services incentives to reduce costs and operate efficiently. That makes sense. Um, that is something that, you know, I would posit the price cap does. Um, creating predictability and stability in rates, um, but also at the same time, assuring adequate revenues for the postal service. So, you know, objectives like that. And Congress wrote in its 10 year review provision that if the commission finds that the system is not working, is not meeting these objectives, um, then it may make such modification or adopt such alternative system as necessary to meet the objectives. So throughout this rate making review, the commission and the postal service, um, and, and, and not surprisingly the labor unions have taken the view that this language, this um, you know, modify or, or adopt an alternative system allows the commission to basically rewrite the statute and wipe the price cap requirement uh, out of the law. And, you know, we on the mailer side uh, disagree with that interpretation. We think the price cap is central and fixed un until and unless Congress explicitly says otherwise. So we have, we have some, um, we have some data to share with you and, and Steve, St Steve, you're gonna lead this. Um, and I would just cue it up by saying that it seems that part of the reason why the commission um, feels like as if it's okay to, to subject uh, market dominant mailers to above inflation price increases is because it's, basic, it's, it's assuming that you won't go anywhere, um, that, that the impact on you know, volume will not be so severe um, as to undo whatever revenue gains these higher prices generate. Um, you know, I think the data belies that, but Steve, why don't you drive for a minute? Right, this graph shows the, the path of total mail volume and nonprofit marketing and periodicals mail volume since 2006. The blue line is nonprofit and it's using the smaller scale on the left. The amber line is total mail using the scale on the right. I should also note that we don't include nonprofit use of first class mail, which the Postal Service doesn't measure separately. And there's a lot of that. Uh, rural cooperatives, rural electric cooperatives mail a lot of bills and statements to their members. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital was just recognized by the Postal Service for very large first-class mailings. And of course, virtually all nonprofits receive donations and membership and subscription orders back through the mail with first-class postage. But just looking at our uh, marketing and periodicals mail, you can see we've declined from 16.4 billion pieces of mail a year to 12.5 last year. Uh, total mail volume peaked in 2006 at 213 billion and it has declined all the way to 129 billion. 
There have been three major disruptions in this period of time, the recession, the exit and surcharge and COVID-19 for the first, for the latter seven months of 2020, fiscal 2020. You can see actually nonprofit mail on a relative basis has not declined as much as total mail. And we now represent more than 10% of all the mail volume that the Postal Service handles. Uh, it's also interesting before 2006 that mail volume grew rapidly. It reached 100 billion in 1980 and 200 billion in 1999 and then peaked at 213. That's one of the reasons why the self-funding through postage only model worked for a couple of decades before it became clear that it really doesn't work now. If we can move on to the next slide, we can look more closely at nonprofit mail itself. And you can see we were growing, actually going into the Great Recession and we peaked out at 14.8 billion pieces of marketing mail and then dropped quite a bit, leveled off after the recession and again dropped during the exit and surcharge, which was a 4.3% surcharge on top of all postage. It's also important to note that the exit and surcharge is the only purposeful disruption here. The other two things nobody intended to happen. This was done on purpose to get mailers to cover a large part of the losses the Postal Service says it incurred because of the Great Recession. The next slide shows nonprofit periodicals, which are really on a downward slope. Uh, these are very important pieces of both what the Postal Service delivers and what nonprofits send in the mail. If you think of some of our most iconic, important uh, pieces of mail sent by nonprofits, you can think of AARP Magazine, Consumer Reports, Guideposts, all of our rural electric cooperatives send out newsletters and magazines to their members. Medical journals like the New England Journal of Medicine are still sent in hard copy mail. Yet these are declining and you can see that the disruptions have added to those declines. The next slide shows uh, both types of nonprofit mail combined and you can see the recession caused a 10% drop, the surcharge caused about an 8% drop and COVID-19 caused almost 6% last year. Uh, these are major disruptions causing reductions in nonprofit mail going into this action by the regulator. And the one that is most relevant, as Eric said, is the exigent surcharge, which was 4.3%. And we knew it was gonna be temporary, yet it led to a permanent 8% decline in our mail. And the, you'll see in a minute that the surcharge, the, actually the, they're not surcharges, they're permanent rate increases that are now being proposed are quite a bit larger than the 4.3 we had during the temporary exigent surcharge. Absolutely, thank you. And, and I'm just gonna stop here for one second. Um, to provide the CLE code uh, for those of you who are joining us um, to get CLE credit and the code is nonprofit challenges, nonprofit challenges. I also saw um, a couple of questions in the Q and A. Um, one was about slides. Uh, I believe we, yes, we will make slides available. Um, and there was also a question about whether if Congress eliminates the retirement pre-funding, um, will it cause the PRC to um, revisit or rescind its rules? So we'll talk about some of the challenges uh, to the rules uh, toward the end. Um, I think the short answer is no, not by itself. Those rules are final, reviewable rules. Um, I suppose it's possible um, that if, uh, if the DC circuit uh, remands the case back to the commission to do a better job, 
Um, and during that time, Congress rescinds the, the retirement prefunding um, that might impact the next set of rules. Uh, but on its own, I, I don't think um, I don't think it will have that impact. Um, so let's talk about the tenure review itself. And, and RM 2017-3 is, is simply the, the docket number uh, that the PRC assigned to this case. And reducing the past four years uh, to a single slide um, really doesn't do justice to the, the level of complexity uh, of this rulemaking and, and really doesn't do justice to the efforts that Steve and the Alliance and, and, and some of our allies, um, other uh, mailer associations, uh, the things that, that they did throughout this four year uh, rulemaking that would, you know, it would take two hours to go through them and 10 more slides. Um, but, you know, mailers repeatedly tried to get in discovery uh, data from the Postal Service about its finances, the value of its assets, the uh, alleged value of its you know, liabilities, all relevant data points in a rulemaking that is assessing whether um, the system is allowing the Postal Service to attain adequate revenues. And, and the commission didn't allow um, those types of information requests, um, which I really think was a mistake. Um, but to kind of simplify the, the procedural history of this docket, a year after the, the review began, the commission issued uh, two orders. Uh, in one order, it found that the, the rate making system was not meeting uh, PAYA's objectives and in particular, that the price cap was not allowing the Postal Service to attain adequate revenues. On the same day in 2017, the commission issued um, a companion order uh, that was the first of three efforts to give the Postal Service above inflation pricing authority. Um, actually, it would probably make more sense. I'm just gonna skip ahead to this slide so that we can, we can you know, track what these proposals did in the 2017 proposal, the commission proposed to allow the Postal Service uh, to raise average prices for each class of market dominant mail by a flat 2% above inflation um, every year for five years. And it would have given the Postal Service additional um, so-called performance-based uh, or, or productivity-based pricing authority of up to another uh, one percentage point. And it would have required the Postal Service to raise average prices on non-compensatory products by an additional 2% above CPI. When I say non-compensatory, I am talking about postal products whose revenues do not cover the costs that are attributable to them. Um, we sometimes refer to non-compensatory products as underwater products. Well, we use those terms interchangeably, but that's why it says underwater in the table. Periodicals are underwater. Um, so are our flat shaped pieces of uh, marketing mail. So what does this mean? It means that under the 2017 proposal, if you're a nonprofit organization that mails, as Steve said, you know, for example, magazines or newsletters, then you would have faced a cumulative price increase of up to 40% over five years. And the Alliance led a coalition of mailers in, in filing extensive comments against the 2017 proposal. Um, that proposal was eventually scrapped and replaced with a new proposal in 2019. And the new proposal withdrew the flat 2% above inflation pricing authority and replaced it with uh, formulas whose inputs would change every year. Uh, one proposal would tie the Postal Service's above inflation pricing authority to year over year declines in mail density, meaning mail volume uh, over delivery point. And another would tie the above inflation pricing authority to the amount of revenue that the Postal Service needs um, to pay its retirement obligations. It kept 
the 1% productivity adder, although modified uh, the formula a little bit. And it kept the 2% surcharge uh, for marketing mail flats, but made that surcharge over periodicals optional. And again, um, the Alliance and our allies filed extensive comments. When I say extensive comments, I mean hundreds of pages uh, supported by expert witnesses, economists, industry experts um, against the 2019 proposal uh, as with the 2017 proposal. And before we got to the final rules, I'll go back a slide. Uh, COVID happened. And so, you know, I recall that our reply comments were filed March 4th of 2020. And less than two weeks later, um, federal and state governments started locking down. Um, there was a federal state of emergency declared. And that obviously had a harmful effect on, on businesses. Um, mail volume plummeted. And we asked the commission to hold its 10 year review in abeyance until the end of the pandemic so that we could accurately assess, and more importantly, the commission could accurately assess the pandemic's impact on uh, volumes and on the rate authority that that proposal service would be given. The commission denied our request. And then over the summer, once we had more volume uh, data at hand, we put in another filing uh, with the commission, which you know, brought, brought these volume uh, drop-offs to light um, because under, under a proposal that gives the postal service you know, heightened pricing authority based on volume declines, um, obviously that would be incredibly harmful to, uh, to, to mailers during a pandemic when, uh, when mail volume is falling off a cliff. And the other side of the coin is the Postal Service doesn't need to charge a, a severe above inflation prices to market dominant mailers in order to generate sufficient revenue because package volume uh, has spiked during the pandemic. How many of you order something from Amazon every day. I know that I do, or my household does. Uh, Jeff Bezos became $77 billion wealthier last year. I think a lot of us have. And packages are more profitable uh, to the postal service than mail is. So our argument was, look, commission, you've got to take all of this into account. Um, and this density proposal, um, it, it doesn't accomplish what, what you think it will. It's going to harm mailers. It's not needed, um, and and if you if you finalize it, you know we think that's an arbitrary decision. Um, unfortunately, that fell on deaf ears, and the commission issued its final rules on November thirtieth of last year. Eric, I just want to add that the density formula is the one that is most. Uh, threatening nonprofit mailers, because as you said, it's based on how much volume declined the year before. And mail volume declined over 10% last year. So their formula, which applies that 10% to what portion of postal costs are overhead or institutional, came up with about four and a half percent rate increase. So the more volume goes down, the more they can raise rates the next year which becomes a sort of self-fulfilling death spiral type mechanism uh, that, that we really have to be concerned about. Absolutely. Um, and just to, just to step in, um, um, we're seeing some questions in the chat and someone asked uh, whether the exigency surcharge of 4.3% will be repealed. So that, that went away in 2016. That was temporary um, and the commission issued an order in March or April of 2016. Um, so mailers are not, are not paying that anymore. Um, but but let, that, me add, let me yeah. add, Eric, that the only reason it was temporary is because we and other mailers fought the Postal Service on that. They wanted to make it permanent. And we won that one. 
but just look at the fact that even a temporary increase reduced our volume by about 8% that hasn't come back. Imagine what these permanent increases that are proposed every year for at least the next five years will do to our use of mail. Absolutely. And we're going to, we're going to talk about the magnitude of this on the next slide. Um, I just want to quickly summarize what the final rules do. Um, they are similar to the 2019 proposal. The final rules keep the density authority and the retirement authority. The only difference is that the density authority is now bankable. That means that if the Postal Service doesn't use all of its pricing authority, um, it is entitled uh, to bank it for use in future years. Um, the productivity increase, that extra 1% has been withdrawn. The commission has indicated that it will look at that separately in a different rulemaking. And um, the extra 2% authority over underwater or non-compensatory products is also bankable. Um, bank rate authority expires after five years and the, and the postal service is limited um, to, to using no more than two percentage points of bank authority uh, per class per year. So, you know, I, I view the final rules as a modest improvement over the 2019 proposal. It's certainly nice to get the 1% productivity adder um, out of this. Um, you know, query whether the, whether the fact that the Postal Service can bank its density and underwater authority um, is a good thing. The, the commission seems to think so. It seems to think that, you know, without having the pressure of a use it or lose it, um, that the Postal Service may, you know, forego some of its uh, pricing authority and save it for future years. Um, and I know people who are optimistic about that. Um, and Steve, I don't know how you feel. I, I, you know that I am less than optimistic um, and that the, the analogy that I am fond of using is uh, you know, throwing a juicy steak into a lion's den and politely asking the lion not to eat all of it. Um, but this, I mean, this is the magnitude of what we're talking about here. Um, on December 31st, the Postal Service filed its data calculations with the commission. And these are the numbers uh, that it came up with. It calculates that it will have 4.5% density authority, a bit over 1% of retirement authority. So that's, a, that's more than 5.5% of above inflation pricing authority for compensatory uh, product classes, things like first class mail. Um, it's more than seven and a half percent supplemental rate authority for underwater products and classes like periodicals and inflation rose by what, about 1.4, 1.45%. So for non-compensatory um, mailers, you know, we're, we're looking at something on the order of nine of a 9% uh, price hike if these get implemented. And again, to the point, will the Postal Service use all that it is given? Well, when it filed its calculations, um, it stated that, and this is a quote, as a general matter, the Postal Service intends to utilize uh, the additional pricing authority granted by the commission. Of course, it, it left open-ended whether it actually would do so, but I tend to think um, that it will. And so, you know, what is the timing of all this? Well, first the commission has to validate the Postal Service's calculations and determine the amount of rate authority that the Postal Service actually has. And the commission will likely do this in March. And the commission's position is that the Postal Service can then turn around and file a notice proposing price changes uh, shortly thereafter. Usually the Postal Service files a notice of rate change for market dominant products in October, but the commission's view is there's nothing preventing the Postal Service from doing that, say in April, right after um, its authority is determined. And once the Postal Service files its notice of proposed rate changes, there'll be a 30 day public comment period. The commission is supposed to 
um, issue an order within 21 days after that, um, determining whether uh, the, the notice of rate change complies with the law. From beginning to end, um, this is supposed to be an, uh, roughly a 90 day process. So there's a bit of uncertainty in terms of timing, but directionally, we would be looking at you know, July of this year for these price increases. However, um, we're not taking this line down. And you know, certainly the Alliance isn't, and, and some of our, our, our allies are not. Um, our view is that these final rules are unlawful. Um, they ignore PEA's requirement that the rate making system have a price cap. They improperly rewrite the statute, something that only Congress can do. Uh, the commission ignored important facts when issuing these rules, and we believe these rules are subject to substantial challenge. And the appropriate forum in which to do that is the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. So the Alliance and other mailer associations, MPA, the Association of Magazine Media, Postcom, the Association for Postal Commerce, the American Catalog Mailers Association, have filed a petition for review of these rules uh, on, on December 18th of last year. Uh, other mailer associations, the, the National Postal Policy Council, the Major Mailers Association have filed their own petition. Um, and the Postal Service has also challenged the rules for the opposite reason. The Postal Service thinks the commission hasn't given it enough. So we have a series of cross petitions filed in court. The cases have all been consolidated. Um, some other mailer associations and nonprofit allies are seeking permission to intervene uh, on, be on behalf of uh, A&M and others. Um, in fact, I'll be, you know, I, sa I said this was in real time and I'll be filing such a motion as soon as this webinar is over. Um, in terms of timing, and, and I'm, I'm going to sort of toggle back and forth here. Um, timing is uncertain. Typically, um, a, a challenge before the DC circuit from, from the time that a petition is filed until the time that the court issues a ruling takes roughly 11 months. Um, that gets us to the end of the year and if the Postal Service is allowed to implement these price increases in say July, um, that means that mailers would still be subject to these price increases, even if we end up winning in court at the end of the year. And we can't get that money back. The law specifically says that we can't get refunds. Um, so the other thing that we are doing is seeking a stay of the rules. Um, First, with the commission, we filed that at the end of last year. Uh, the Postal Service opposed, of course. Uh, the commission hasn't ruled yet, but it will certainly deny our motion. And then we will ask the court to stay these rules um, pending its, its review on the merits. Um, getting a stay is difficult, but here we have a strong public interest in favor of stopping these rules stopping these price increases. Um, we really think we have a good statutory argument here. Um, so that is what the Alliance and its allies are doing, uh, literally as we speak, uh, fighting tooth and nail against these rules in court. Um, but the DC circuit is not our only avenue for advocacy. And Steve, I know you wanna talk a little bit about um, Hill advocacy and, and, and other, other roads here. Yeah, Eric, there's widespread agreement that we need comprehensive reform of the postal law. And the Alliance has been advocating these four elements that should, should be in a new postal law. One is retaining the CPI rate cap without any add-ons. This is really necessary to retain the base of customers that the Postal Service has and possibly even grow mail volume in the future. Even those package 
services that are growing at 50% rely on the mail because the reason the Postal Service can deliver packages at a reasonable cost is because they have letter carriers delivering mail to every address every day. Secondly, there's a need for a much more efficient and reliable postal operations. This has been documented over and over again by the Inspector General, the GAO, by, by our filings from experts, and it's, it's a necessary component. Third, restructuring the retiree health benefit pre-funding and reducing the amount the Postal Service has to put in every year. Everybody agrees that needs to be done. That was a mistake Congress made. And fourth, we advocate that there's a certain portion of Postal Service costs that are driven by mandates from the government called the Universal Service Obligation that really should be funded by the government. As Eric mentioned, they were every year before the 1980s. These are costs that add up to several billion dollars a year that the Pulse Service would not be incurring if it were simply a business providing uh, the mailing services that it does. So we want to have a little time to work with Congress. We've already briefed the Biden administration that seems very committed to working with Congress on postal reform about these needs and about our concerns. Uh, we can't ask Congress to influence the court or the regulator, but uh, if, if you turn to the next slide, we can, we can ask members of Congress to at least urge the Postal Service to not use this new authority in the near term with everything that's going on with COVID and with the fact that we're possibly on the cusp of working on real reform of the postal law. The two committees that are relevant here are listed here. You can check and see if you have members from your state or district on these committees and contact them and urge them to urge the Postal Service to wait on using this extra pricing authority and also to urge them to work on postal reform along the lines of those four bullets on the previous slide. It's really important that we get comprehensive reform in the near term, rather than trying to fix everything with the one lever that the Postal Regulatory thinks that Commission thinks that it has, which is the pricing lever. Eric, back to you. Well, that was that was great, and that's that is um, that's our last slide. Our our final slide uh, just reminds you of our of our February webinar. Um, I'll leave it up here, but we did get some questions in the chat. Um, so with the with with the two minutes that we have remaining, um, we can turn to them. Um, someone someone asked, did PAYA have anything in the statute about the financial stability that commission has created, um, short-term, medium-term, and long-term financial needs definitions that the regulator came up with. Um, so that's an excellent question. And uh, so the answer is, is, is no. The, um, the law uh, includes as one of nine statutory objectives that the rate-making system has to achieve um, is to assure adequate revenues, including retained earnings for the postal service to maintain financial stability. Um, the commission uh, during the early part of, of this rulemaking uh, interpreted that uh, particularly the retained earnings language as justifying this sort of bifurcation or I guess trifurcation of, of looking at the postal services fin uh, financial stability in terms of short-term, medium, and long-term, and determined that um, the Postal Service has achieved short-term uh, financial stability, um, but not medium and long-term. And you know, the Alliance and, and some, of, some of our allies put in really extensive comments during phase two of, of the rulemaking that challenged this um, and, and, and talked about you know, the the significant value of the Postal Service's real estate holdings, for example, um, and how, you know, how much it has in the way of assets. Um, 
certainly now, the, I mean, the, the, the Postal Service's liquidity and, and cash situation is, is quite good now. Um, I think you would agree with me, Steve. Uh, we were talking yesterday. I think the Postal Service has, what, $16 billion in cash on hand? Um, plus, yeah, the, plus the grant they, under the uh, under the CARES Act. I think their liquidity is probably the strongest it's ever been. At the end of December, they had over 16 billion in the Postal Service Fund, which is their operating cash. Congress recently turned the $10 billion CARES loan into a grant, so that's another 10 billion in cash they have to spend. Plus, they have another 1 billion and borrowing authority. So that's 27 billion, which shows that uh, there's plenty of time to work on comprehensive reform before you start worrying about financial stability. We also think that PRC put much too emphasis on financial stability, which is only one of many objectives and factors in the Postal Service law that they need to take into account. Agree. Um, I see a question. Uh, Tell us more about the productivity. What does withdrawn mean in terms of a timeline? Will it need to be brought up in a new rule? Um, Yes, it will be brought up in a new new rule. So um, that 1% supplemental rate authority has been withdrawn. It is not part of the final rules. It is not part of um, the Alliance's legal challenge. I do not know, and I don't know if you if you do, Steve, when the commission plans on opening a new docket, but it but it will be a new docket. Um, actually, actually, Eric, they just did in the last few days, and uh, they're they're looking for suggestions on how to incentivize greater productivity and efficiency, which is sort of like putting the cart way before the horse. Yeah. Now give them the big price increases and then figure out as a regulator how we can help them be more efficient. There's another question about the cumulative 2% increases for underwater products, which are mainly periodicals and marketing mail flats. And that will not bring them to full coverage, the, the questioner says. And that's true. And the reason is because there's huge opportunities to reduce the cost of handling and processing and delivering flats in the postal system, which we and and several other organizations have documented and the Postal Service has a task force working on that. So uh, we'd rather work on those initiatives before we push even more mail out of the system with large rate increases. Well, and with that, we're at 1.31. We've hit the hour, um, but really loved uh, all of this engagement um, and these questions. And Steve, thank you so much for your time and expertise. Um, Great working with you on this. Yes, it is. It's a really important time for nonprofits. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone.